Hey guys, this is John. I hope you're all doing well. I want to share a quick instructive endgame from a Blitz game that I played today on the Internet Chess Club. Yeah, the ICC, it's still around. That will be a blast from the past for many of you. <laughs> and in my mind, this example illustrates a couple things. So one, the importance of analyzing your games and being absolutely ruthless with yourself, totally honest and, and self-critical. And two, how easy it is to mess up seemingly basic end games. <laughs> you will see that both my opponent and myself did that in this game. So this was a five minute game. My opponent was Grandmaster Nanad Ristic from Serbia, and we joined the position on move 70. I was black here, we're looking at it from my point of view, so my pawns are going this way. This is a drawn two versus one pawn ending, but with my opponent's next move, they actually blow the draw. So white can hold with any king move to the E file, with king E3 being the most obvious, but instead my opponent played king C2, looking to maintain the, dis the distant opposition. But by playing king c2, white allowed f4. I can just push this f pawn, because if white captures the f pawn, white's king will be outside the square of the pawn. I can play g3, and if we draw our square, you can search my channel for this if you're unfamiliar with this concept, white's king cannot enter the square. They must get to the edge of the square at least in order to be able to stop the pawn, but white is not going to be able to do that, and the pawn will promote. So. It's apparent that after f4, white cannot capture the pawn. So my opponent played king d3. Now, I was streaming this game on my Twitch channel, and I mentioned immediately that this was a critical decision. And you can see the timestamps. I actually have a fair amount of time by my standards for a blitz game <laughs> in the end game here. I have 49 seconds. My opponent has 53 seconds. I have to decide here what to do. And in particular, there's really only two moves to look at. f takes g3 or f3. So if you want a little challenge, and I highly recommend you do this, try to figure out what you would do as black. So pause the video, should black play f takes g3 or f3? All right, this will probably come as no surprise, but I chose the wrong move here. <laughs> and it's a little embarrassing because I just finished making the videos for 100 end games you must know a few months ago. Uh, an awesome endgame resource where I looked at scenarios exactly like this in slightly simpler form. But this is something that I, I should know cold, basically. But reproducing it in a blitz game with the clock ticking and the pressure, not easy. And I played F takes G3 here. This is incorrect, grabbing the pawn. Now, I did this mainly because I saw that I'd be able to keep both pawns. I knew that white would be able to bring their king back and stop the pawns from promoting, so white played king e2. But I just figured with the two pawns, I should be winning here. So I brought my king up. But it soon dawned upon me that this pawn on g3 actually gets in my way. So in this position, if I were to play the obvious king f3, I actually played king e3 in the game, but let's say I play king f3. White plays king f1, white has opposition. And black always runs into this issue. If they play g2 check, king g1, there are stalemates possible. King g3 is stalemate, and pawn g3 is stalemate. And any other move just allows white to take on g2, and this is a drawn king and pawn versus king ending. So that darn pawn on g3 just gets in the way here. Black cannot win as a result of that. And we played around a little bit. I played king e3, king g2, king f4 defending. But king g1, white's just keeping the opposition, and soon we agreed the game drawn. So instead, if we back up to that moment where I captured on g3, f3 was winning here. And the thing that, that did not click in my head, which I know and I've gone over before, but I was not able to reproduce in the game, maybe the pattern wasn't strong enough, is that black wins just by giving away the f-pawn. It's not even important that black has a protected pass pawn. What's important is that black has a pawn on the fourth rank with the opponent's pawn immediately behind it on the third rank. And black will eventually win this white pawn on g3. They will capture it with king takes g3 and black's king will stand on a key square where no matter where white's king is, black will be winning. Even if white's king is on g1 and white has opposition. So for example, let's say white plays king e3 here. Black can start bringing their king up. 
king d5. Maybe white will even try to keep black's king out for the time being. But black just gives away this f-pawn. That's the important thing. If black insists on keeping the f-pawn, they can't win. So let's say something like this happens. And black tries to flank into the position. Black is still winning here, actually, if they just play f2 at some point. But getting too attached to this f-pawn is going to run into a similar problem I had in the game. So playing f2 check here, king f1, and now king f3 is a stalemate. So giving the f-pawn, on the other hand, will set black free. So backing it up here after king d5, let's say white does play king d3, just f2, king e2, and black can play king e4, allowing king takes f2. But now after king d3, black flanks in. And because these squares are controlled, white is unable to reach around and attack the black g-pawn, and white is just eventually going to lose their pawn on g3. It's inevitable. Let's say king g2, black can play king e2 or king e3, it doesn't matter. King g1, king f3, king h2, trying to hold the pawn still, but after king f2, king h1, this pawn is captured on the g3 square. This is a key square that the black king now occupies. This is something I talk about in 100 endgames you must know. It's a common king and pawn versus king concept. So black wins no matter where the white king is. And with a pawn on g4 in this instance, that would be true if the black king were on any of these three highlighted squares, h3, g3, or f3. So white can play king g1. If we move this back and the black pawn were on g5 and the black king were on g4, white's king were on g2, this would be a draw. But because that pawn is one square further up, black wins. Let's say king h3, king h1, black rolls the pawn, g3, king g1, g2, king f2, king h2, white's king has been squeezed out, and the pawn promotes. So that pattern, even though I've seen it before, I know it, I've explained it on camera, it just didn't click for me there. And in that time pressure, I wasn't able to bring myself to play f3 and, and just note that the f-pawn isn't valuable. It's, it's just about winning that g-pawn and not being uh, blocked up when you do so. So an instructive little endgame here. I recommend that you play this out if you're at, at all uncertain about the mechanics of it. It was painful for me to not win this game against a grandmaster on stream, but I hope that serves as a lesson to you guys that I have absolutely no problem, nor should anyone have a problem, in sharing a game where they messed up. Uh, yeah, it's embarrassing, but this is how you really strengthen these ideas in your head. And I know I'm not going to miss this again in the future. I'm quite confident about that. And I'm even going to drill some positions on my own having to do with this scenario where you're capturing the pawn on a key square just to make certain that I know this. So fun little example at my expense. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions about it, leave a note in the comments. So once again, hope you guys are doing well with all of this pandemic uh, noise and uncertainty going on and i will try to make another video again soon all right guys have a good one bye